Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to uh, the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination and our ongoing occasional sci-fi flick film series. But uh, this is an extra special installment of that, uh, of that series for us. Um, because, and I want to thank you all for being here tonight so that we can uh, bring, be one of the first places on planet Earth to, uh, to have this film arrival arrive. Um, so we're very, very excited to have that here. And, and for an event that we're also very excited because this is, um, this is helping us, uh, it's a, something that we haven't done with the other films is that we're using this as a fundraiser uh, for the Clarion Science Fiction Writer, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop. So, um, and, and so it's very fortunate that we have a, a film based on a story from one of the graduates of the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop and, and someone who's come back to teach at the Clarion Science Fiction Writers Workshop, Ted Chang. <laughs> so the film arrivals based on his Nebula winning sh uh, story, The Story of Your Life. And, um, uh, and, and, as, and someone, you know, as myself, I have a great appreciation for that story and I'm, I'm really looking forward to how this, uh, how they made a movie out of it. Um, it's always this interesting process of how one art form gets adapted into another. And in particular, there are certain things about this movie that I just can't wait to see what, how, how, what they've done with it. And I'm not going to say anything about what those things are um, until, until after the movie. And so tonight, um, what we're going to do is, um, uh, uh, you know, I'll say a few words. And Shelley Streeby, the uh, UCSD faculty director of the Clarion Writers Workshop, will say a couple of things. And then <coughs> we'll watch the movie. And then afterwards, we'll sit with Ted and... Uh, and uh, find out all the dirt behind uh, <laughs> what happened when they were making this movie. Um, um, but you know, this movie I think is really interesting because while science fiction movies are are, are fairly com a fairly common genre these days, um, it isn't so common for them to be made from actual science fiction literature, except maybe for comic books, um, if you consider them science fiction. And so one of the uh, significant focuses of the Clark Center is this um, spurring of the development of, of critical, uh, critically speculative cultural forms, and that these often arise from collaborations that we do with science fiction authors and trying to bring the kind of methodologies and, and processes of science fiction into a direct engagement with uh, other arts and sciences. And, um, and, and so I just want to also, you know, there's a number of projects that we have in progress that uh, will be coming to fruition in the coming year with collaborations with science fiction authors. And so keep abreast of them on our website and also with our a new podcast that we've just launched. So um, the first episode went up uh, just a few days ago. So if you haven't uh, checked that out, um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite ex exciting. Um, S but um, but w back with this event, I just want to uh, say a few words of thanks to the people who helped make this happen, and uh, in particular, Ted, for um, uh, really uh, helping us uh, engage with the movie studio that um, uh, and worked through the actually not so complicated negotiations with Paramount to get the movie here. So that was a, that was an, a nice surprise, because we've had some other things we've tried to do where we've run into some tricky things with uh, movie studios. Um, the only thing I would say with that is that um, because it's a premiere, um, and I actually think this applies to any movie screening you go to, but we want to make sure that you keep your cell phones uh, away and uh, no photographs or recording of the movie in any way possible. And, and, uh, and we've got some people here to make sure that that, <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> So um, I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, electromagnetic pulse weaponry they are carrying, <laughs> but um, um, and um, uh, so Ted was terrific in helping make this happen, and I think it is a testament to his, uh, to the not only his but 
the kind of general sense of, of appreciation and commitment that people going through Clarion end up uh, having towards, the sign, the, towards that workshop, um, where many of them go on and come back and become faculty in that workshop and help uh, uh, carry on the legacy, the great impact and legacy that, that, that it has on, on the field of science fiction and fantasies and fantasy. Um, uh, but I also want to thank uh, a, f a couple other people, um, uh, 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 Patrick Coleman, the Clark Center uh, direct, uh, Administrative Director, and, uh, and I, think it, I think it was Patrick's idea to do this, and, um, and, I, don't, and I'm, I know he's, and it was his, not only his idea, but certainly his determination and tenacity that uh, has, has made this night happen. Um, and the other key person that I want to thank for this is the, um, and, and who's also, I also want to recognize for the recent uh, success of Clarion over the last few years as it's come into uh, UCSD and the Clark Center is, is, is uh, the faculty director Shelley Streeby, who's a professor of <laughs> literature and ethnic studies. And, um, and, and I have to say, you know, I haven't, had the privilege of, of attending Clarion, although all of us around it are super jealous of everybody who gets to go through Clarion. Um, but I've certainly learned quite a bit from just watching uh, uh, Shelley's engagement with Clarion, her commitment and deafness at, at ensuring that every year um, uh, it, becomes in, it becomes better and better under her, under her, under her watch. So with that, I'll give you Shelley, and she'll say a few more words about uh, tonight's event. Well, thank you for those kind words, Sheldon. And uh, it's great to see you all here tonight uh, for such a wonderful event. I couldn't be happier to see so many familiar faces in the room. Uh, as Clarion's faculty director since 2010, I'm really thrilled to see uh, Ted here and to be able to host Arrival. Uh, we're so lucky to have Ted Chang in the house for this special event. And I want to begin by thanking him for generously giving his time and making it possible for us to bring this event to the community. So Ted, could you stand up so we could see you here? And uh, thank you for coming. Yay. So he'll have more to say uh, after the event. Um, so as Sheldon was telling you, tonight's event is a fundraiser for Clarion. And I also want to emphasize here at the beginning how lucky we are at UCSD to have Clarion here and to have the privilege of hosting it. Um, it's a time when there's a lot of diminishing state support for public education. And there are a lot of rich private schools out there that would just love to host Clarion. And so I'm especially grateful uh, to all of you who are here tonight showing your support for Clarion UCSD. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank Sheldon Brown and the Arthur C. Clarke Center, as well as Steve and Sue Hart for keeping Clarion going here during times that have been a little bit tougher, when I sometimes worried about whether we could provide enough material support to keep this wonderful project going here at UCSD. But we have, and as Sheldon says, I think it just keeps getting better and better with all of your support. So for those of you who are just learning about Clarion, it's a six-week workshop for aspiring science fiction and fantasy writers, and it's the oldest and most prestigious workshop of its kind in the world. It was founded in 1968 at Clarion State College in Pennsylvania, and then it moved to Michigan State in 1972 before finally arriving here at UCSD in 2006. And the list of Clarion's illustrious alumni is huge, and it includes such giants in the field as Nalo Hopkinson, also in the house tonight. <laughs> Nalo, would you mind standing up? Uh, I know a lot of people will be very excited to, to see you here. Thank you. And other alums include Octavia Butler, Kim Stanley Robinson, Corey Doctorow, Kelly Link, Nettie Akorafor, Bruce Sterling, Jeff Vandermeer, and of course Ted himself. And many of these giants in the field have given back to Clarion by returning as instructors. So I've been fortunate enough to have the honor of being in the Clarion classroom with both Ted and Nalo. And I really look forward to welcoming Nalo back again next year. I know already 
that Clarion 2017 will be in excellent hands. Uh, UCSD also really benefits from Clarion's presence on campus. So for instance, throughout the year, Clarion alumni and instructors generously donate their time uh, to do all kinds of special events on campus. So last year, all of the Muir College first year students, which means hundreds of students, uh, were reading Clarion President Karen Joy Fowler's award-winning novel, We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which is soon to be an HBO miniseries starring Natalie Portman. And Karen traveled to UCSD on her own dime. She did not take a speaker's fee, though she usually commands one of several thousand. And we'd reserved a room that held 100, but the crowd was so large, the fire marshal came by and told us we couldn't stay there. We had to leave. So we went outside and got a boom box, and she spoke to a crowd of hundreds of first-year students in the dark, in the cold, who didn't want to let her go. They just asked her question after question. That's just you know one of the many benefits of Clarion being here. And last spring, Kim Stanley Robinson also paid his own way. He took no speaker fee. And he spoke to three different audiences, uh, including a packed room, standing room only in the literature department, uh, speaking on climate change uh, to all of us, the faculty and the students there. So Ted is yet another really wonderful example of this generosity. Not only is he joining us tonight, uh, but he was kind enough to join us last June when we held a conference in honor of the late great Clarion alum uh, Octavia Butler, who was also Ted's teacher at Clarion. And I'd assigned work, uh, Ted's work to over 300 students over in Six College, again a bunch of first year students, and I was so delighted to see him very kindly and patiently uh, engage the eager young people who had showed up wanting to meet the famous author that they had just read. And 15 of them presented their visions of the future 50 years from now to a big conference crowd. And many of these visions of the future were inspired by Ted's work. So just one of many examples of how Clarion uh, makes an impact on our campus. But in addition to all that that Clarion does for UCSD, it also creates a wonderful community that extends beyond UCSD to the larger uh, Southern California area and the world. We increasingly have students coming from all over the world to come to Clarion, and many of those students go on to publish significant work and often to be nominated right away for major awards in the field. And most of these students don't have very much money. Even those who aren't poor, they have to sacrifice. They have to take time off from work or other obligations and give up that income while attending Clarion. So that's why the support we get and the scholarships we give are so important. And we have several to which people can make donations. You can look on the Clarion website and find them. Two I would mention, one uh, is the Leonard Pung Memorial Scholarship. It's established by the Clarion class of 2009 in honor of the late Leonard Pung, who died in 2012, uh, much too young. And it's a tribute to his spirit and creativity and courage. And this scholarship is given to a student who begins study at the Clarion workshop after the age of 40. So it's a wonderful way to have a slightly older uh, student be able to take up this work you know, at a time in their life when it might be really difficult to make a change like this. And because Leonard was only starting to live his dream when he passed away, his classmates hope his scholarship will enable others to finish the journey that he began. And then another incredibly important scholarship we have is the Octavia E. Butler Scholarship, which is given to a writer of color by the Carl Brandon Society each year. We're truly grateful for these fellowships, and we just encourage people to, who care about Clarion to try to donate uh, to support them. So I'm happy to see this community created by Clarion turning out in force tonight to support Ted and celebrate his most recent and a string of successes. He graduated from Brown University with a computer science degree and in 1989 graduated from the Clarion Writers Workshop. He received a Nebula Award for Tower of Babylon in 1990, the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 1992, a Nebula Award, and the Theodore Sturgeon Award for Story of Your Life, which we're about to see the film adaptation of, uh, many, many other awards, including a Nebula, Locus, and Hugo for Hell is the Absence of God, a Nebula and Hugo for The Merchant and the Alchemist Gate, uh, and a British Science Fiction Award, a Locus Award, and a Hugo Award for Best Short Story for Exhalation. And then finally, a Hugo Award and Locus Award for his novella, The Life Cycle of Software Objects, which is probably my personal favorite of this long list of works. Um, he's also an incredible teacher, as I can say, from 
being in the classroom with him twice, once in 2012 and then again just last summer. His students love him. He's an incredibly generous and effective teacher. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say about the movie in the Q&A that follows. So uh, thanks again. Enjoy the movie. And I look forward to our conversation afterwards. So I was asking Ted just over there uh, how, many, how many times he'd seen this movie now. Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is my third viewing. Mm -hmm. And so we're, when, um, when the movie was getting made, uh, I, I, maybe you could tell a little bit about the process of actually getting, the, getting, the, getting from the story to the movie. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, sure. Sure. Uh, well, the story was originally published back in uh, 1998. Mm -hmm. um, then in uh, 2011, I was contacted by a couple of producers, uh, Dan Cohen and uh, Dan Levine. They work for a production company called 21 Laps. Uh, they told me that uh, uh, this screenwriter named Eric Heiser, he, um, he had pitched them the idea of adapting uh, this the story of mine, and so they were contacting me about uh, uh, getting permission. And um, so I was initially, you know, kind of surprised because because um, it's not a story that seems like an obvious candidate for adaptation. Um, have a lot of people here have read has read the story. Yeah, a good number of people. Yeah. Um, but for, you know, for those who haven't read the story, you know, the story, it's a very uh, sort of internal story. And it's mostly, in a, in a lot of ways, it's a story about uh, thinking. And that's not something that um, is easily translated to film. But uh, I, uh, they persuaded me that uh, you know, they... Um, I mean, in some ways, you know, simply the fact that they had chosen such an unlikely story, you know, uh, you know, that, that definitely sparked my interest. And, um, you know, they persuaded me that, you know, they were interested in telling a, uh, a sort of unconventional science fiction story. Mm -hmm. They weren't going, they didn't want to make a sort of traditional science fiction movie. So uh, I was, you know, I was I was, you know, in a lot of ways, I was curious to see what, you know, how they would do it. And so I, um, I went ahead with that. Um, so Eric wrote a screenplay and um, he, uh, they, so they, they sent it around. And um, my understanding is the screenplay got a lot of, it, well, it got a lot of very positive responses, but um, it took a while uh, before anyone was willing to actually uh, finance it. Um, uh, I am told that uh, more than once he, uh, Eric Heiser was uh, told by uh, producers that uh, if he would uh, make the protagonist a man, they, uh, they would, oh, wow. uh, they, <laughs> they, they, they would finance it on the spot. Um, but, he, you know, he stuck to his guns and um, eventually it, um, uh, was financed by an in independent film company, uh, Film Nation, um, and uh, uh, Denis Villeneuve came aboard, and uh, he he approached Amy Adams. Uh, I believe she was his first choice, um, so th she signed aboard, and uh, after she uh, after she signed on. Um, uh, Paramount, uh, Paramount uh, got uh, domestic distribution rights, and Sony uh, got international distribution rights, and um, and then they eventually, uh, in uh, summer of 2015, they they actually uh, uh, shot the film. Mm. 
Are there things that you think are especially successful in the adaptation that you like? Uh, on the other hand, are there things you feel were difficult to adapt that you are sorry could not quite make it to the screen? Well, you know, like I said, it's the story. Uh, it's a it's an unlikely candidate for adaptation. So uh, it was obvious that they were going to have to make. You know, uh, they were going to have to change a lot of things in order to make it uh, an actual movie. But um, I felt so. I, you know, I read uh, a draft of the screenplay, you know, uh, an early draft, and you know, I felt that it retained the essential emotional core of the story, and um, and that was you know. Uh, that was what I wanted, you know, and uh, so I, uh, so, you know, the, the changes that they made, I understood why they were there. I, um, uh, they all, you know, uh, they made sense to me, you know, and uh, mostly I was just hoping that, you know, through the development process, um, that that emotional core would remain intact and, um, and I, I, I believe it has. Yes, I agree. <laughs> so, um, but th maybe there's, well, there's a number of things. You could kind of start to, and I'm just starting to absorb the film, and of course, kind of making, making things in comparison to the story. And maybe the one thing that stands out to me as a, as a significant difference is just the manner of the, of the death of the child is quite different in the, in the, story and in the movie and and you know I'm not not sure this is uh, the filmmakers having her die from a disease versus versus by a, a kind of more willful choice um, or uh, you know I don't know if I should even give away the story part but uh, but there's something about the kind of um, almost a way in which it seems like the mother could have could have intervened in the daughter's life um, in a way that she couldn't in this in the movie, and and it kind of raised the stakes about the question of, of free will and temporality a little bit higher maybe than than the movie did. I don't know. Did you have a reaction to that to that shift in in particular? Um, well, okay. Um, and first, I guess I I guess I should just say. Um, I'm hoping that when, if you, you know, if you're on social media about the movie, uh, just hold off on talking about the ending, <laughs> you know, um, until after it has actually you know, um, been released to theaters. Um, so, okay, so uh, <laughs> the, the question of, you know, um, the daughter's death and the, the on the and movie versus story. Um, well, okay, so there are a couple of differences. One is that in the movie, uh, the daughter dies at a younger age than in the story. Um, I I expect that there was, and um, uh, I'll, I, sh I should also say, that, like, uh, I did not talk to Eric specifically about these things, but um, these are my takes on, you know, why, you know, having, you know, reading the screenplay, um, you know, I figure like um, it probably it, it makes sense for the daughter to die at a young age for uh, you know a few reasons. One is that um, uh, because of the nature of the way it is uh, done in the film, um, if the daughter uh, lives to say twenty five, then uh, Amy Adams's age should be you know there's there should be more of a visible difference in her age. And um, uh, that would that would give things away. So mm. by you know shortening that, uh, you can sort of uh, get away with a little. Visually, it holds mm. a little more cohesive there. Yeah. Yes. Um, so that, that's my assumption on that regard. Mm -hmm. um, as for the um, the aspect of it being uh, 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 cancer versus. Uh, or I mean, a disease instead of uh, sort of a, an accident. Um, you know, yes, it, as you say, it does. Um, there's a difference in sort of um, how much 
uh, sort of agency, um, the um, uh, the parents could possibly exercise in this, um, and I think that you know uh, you know the the questions raised in the the question about agency in the story, you know, it's uh, in a lot of ways it's a tough sell. And I think that I guess one of the things I've just found about it, and I'll get off this point in a sec. But mm. but the um, but in the story, it just added it gave a something about the poignancy of parenting itself, mm. right? Mm -hmm. That uh, that <clears throat> you you know you think you have this kind of this deliberate this deliberateness and kind of bringing bringing something into into being, but recognizing that kind of point at which you actually don't have. You know, your agency has limits mm -hmm. to what you can do in the act of parenting. And, and I think the story kind of, <coughs> that's just one of the kind of emotional notes that I think the, the story in the movie plays many of these notes as well, that just plays it really, you know, really wonderfully, you know, in talking about both the, the kind of, the, you know, the, this kind of act of parenting as, as, as having these things that, you know, can bring you the greatest joy and the greatest sorrow. Um, and... Uh, so, and I think in general that's, you know, as you said, wonderfully carried through in the in the in the movie and makes it have this kind of unlikely combination of what you often find in most kind of contact scenario movies that uh, that, that come out more often than not from science fiction. So, um, in science fiction cinema, um, I also think perhaps that in your story. Uh, you know, when you have um, the protagonist thinking that you're able to see some of the, f the frustration and ambivalence she has around the child in some ways being different for her, from her as much as she loves her, mm -hmm. the ways she's like the father, the ways that she will risk herself in ways that the protagonist herself would not. And that, um, I think it gives it a complexity and a, and a kind of ambivalence that would be hard to uh, get you know, Hollywood filmmaker to foreground, I think kind of removing that sort of struggle and some of that ambivalence around the child, you know, would be something that a more sentimental narrative of parenting mm -hmm. would have to kind of worry over. But I feel like your story actually shows those complexities in really profound ways that would be hard for uh, a film to capture, personally. You know, uh, yeah, I, I think that, um, <laughs> You know, um, yeah. Again, because of the, the you know, just the difference in the two mediums, mm -hmm. that um, uh, yeah, film has to yeah, films. You know, they're um, uh, they sort of have to m move in broad strokes mm -hmm. a lot of times because you know you don't have a lot of time mm -hmm. to tell a story, and um, so. Uh, you, uh, there may be you know certain subtleties which, uh, because you know in a in a story you can have subtleties um, based on you know just a, a few words mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's you're not going to have time to to try and capture all of those in a film, but you know I think the the essential aspect mm -hmm. of the story about um uh that that uh parenting is filled with joy and pain mm -hmm. you know it, or joys and frustrations no matter you know in no matter what the scenario is parenting is going to be filled with those and um so i think you know in that uh, regard you know i think the movie does capture you know the these sort of contradictory parts of parenting uh uh and you know that is that is uh, th that is uh, faithful to the story in, in that regard. I agree. And one thing I think it did very well that is difficult is showing the complexity of nonlinear time that you're playing with in the story. That seems like a profoundly difficult thing to, you know, succeed in doing in a film. And so I thought that was especially powerful myself. I wonder if you're happy with how that turned out. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I think. You know, like I said, I I'm 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 quite happy with the film. I I think that, um, well, 
when you consider sort of the you know the track record of movie adaptations of written science fiction, mm. you know it it's it, it you know it it, it doesn't it. It doesn't give you a lot of reason to be optimistic, <laughs> and so, um, but the you old know, uh, this 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 uh, this movie has turned out like incredibly well. Yep. Um, you know, I think you know it. It looks great. It does you know, look great. Yep. You know, it sounds great. You know, it you know, great performances. Like I think it it works on all these levels and. You know, for all of these things to have come together, uh, you know, it is, it's, it's kind of miraculous. It is miraculous. I'm glad. It couldn't happen to a nicer guy. Yeah, and it's a, you know, and, a, and I mean, it was definitely a question going in, knowing how, uh, since, the, since the subject is so much about language, in, when you're reading the story, you're, ex you're having a, a visceral experience of some of the kind of the actual things that the movie is talking about. You're experiencing aspects of the medium that is the subject of the, um, of the story. And so looking at how that could translate into cinema, I think they, I, I agree, I think they did a uh, really uh, a good job of, of not oversimplifying or over explaining, mm. um, but actually trying to come up with methods that would give you a sense of that experience and adding in maybe a, another little plot thread that, uh, or two that could that could help tease that out. Um, uh, so I, I also just wanted to ask you um, to to reflect a little bit back on on your experiences of of um, of becoming a science fiction writer and how um, and you know I understand that uh, your 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 scholarly path uh, was taking you through other fields of things like physics and computer science. And, um, and what made you, uh, you know, when did Clarion become, come on your radar screen as something that you wanted to, uh, to take a stab at? And, and, uh, and well, I, um, when did, I first became aware of Clarion, I think um, probably when I was in high school, because I believe because I believe Isaac Asimov mentions it in his introductions to the Hugo winners. Um, uh, I, uh, I, you know, I, I remember you know, reading the, you know, the, the Hugo winner anthologies uh, when I was young, and um, you know, this was at a time when you know, you know, w there was no, there was not only was there no internet, but even things like. Um, uh, you know, magazines about like there's a magazine Locus that's sort of a news magazine of the science fiction field, um, but back then you know uh, I did not know that magazine existed. There was no place to find that magazine. You know, um, so um, so my knowledge of science fiction as a community came from things like the introductions to stories in anthologies when you know uh, the anthologist would talk a little bit about uh, just the world of science fiction and the author mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I think that was where I first heard about Clarion as a workshop um, then you know when I was in college I um, uh, by that point I had actually you know gotten my hands on an actual issue of Locus magazine and then you know, was able to subscribe to it. Um, and uh, Clarion uh, ran ads, you know, e every year they, uh, they, would, they had an ad for the workshop in, in Locus magazine. And, um, you know, I had also over time learned more about, like read other anthologies and heard more about Clarion as a workshop that a lot of writers had attended. And um, and so it sort of uh, loomed large in my imagination as uh, the uh, the place to go to um, to sort of become a science fiction writer. Was a, uh, uh, um, not that it was you know, a, a requirement, but that it was uh, really um, it would it would be a, 
a great opportunity um, if you could if you could get in. And um, did you get uh, in on your first try? Um, I well, uh, I uh, I didn't apply until my um, my senior year of college, uh, partly because uh, it's hard to it's hard to um, uh, take six weeks off, and um, so like in the previous summers when I was in college, I had um, I had things like I had you know an internship or had these you know these these uh, uh, summer classes that I uh, was signed up for, um, but uh, because you know uh, you're constantly trying to sort of build your resume when when you're a college student, but I um, I knew that the summer after I graduated. I figured that would I would have that summer open, so uh, so that so I uh, that was the year I applied and I, I got in. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience like for you when you did your clarion? What do you think? Uh, what were the valuable things that you gained? Would you say? Um, well, I guess uh, I uh, I I personally found clarion to be um, a life changing experience. Mm -hmm. Um, for for me, especially you know, again at the time that I went, you know, there was no internet, um, so I had you know very little sense of science fiction as a community. I knew of science fiction as a uh, as a genre of literature, um, but it was it was it was purely a genre of, uh, that I read, uh, nothing else. And by that, I mean, you know, I didn't really know anyone else who read science fiction, so I didn't even have anyone to talk to okay. about science fiction. <laughs> so um, it was purely an abstract, you know, uh, pursuit. Um, when I went to Clarion, I was suddenly surrounded by people who had read all the books that I had read and who uh, I could uh, talk about with them, uh, uh, talk with them about, and they, they um, so you know, I suddenly <coughs> was in a community of like-minded people. And um, a lot of people say that uh, attending Clarion is sort of like uh, discovering uh, the family you didn't know you had. And I definitely feel like uh, that is true for me. So what does it feel like to come back as an instructor now, and how do you think about that kind of work? What do you think about trying to accomplish when you come as a teacher? Well, I think that um, uh, the, you know, science fiction has, has science fiction, it's sort of a related fields like fantasy and horror. You know, they are, you know, they're much bigger communities now. Um, but I think, um, uh, Clarion continues to be um, a uh, uh, a major avenue toward becoming a uh, a writer in the field. Um, I think, in a lot of ways, um, uh, even though the field ha has grown so large, and there are now other ways, other there are other workshops, uh, online workshops, all these other opportunities. Uh, ways for people to uh, um, become writers or you know, learn more about writing. Um, I guess I guess I still think of Clarion as um, uh, being at the top of that of any list mm -hmm. of ways to learn uh, how to become a, a writer of speculative fiction. Um, I think that uh, uh, Clarion continues to be uh, uh, the place where th the best uh, aspiring writers apply, and um, so uh, I think you know the I think the the caliber of student now is 
uh, much higher than uh, when I w was a student. It's incredible, uh, the talent, yeah. Well, uh, and I mean, in, in the last, every, you know, every year when they, you know, awards have been coming out, the award nominations, um, it's just amazing how many of those people being nominated for the major science fiction awards are Clarion grads. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if off the top of your head you can reel off some yeah. of the latest numbers, Shelley. From well, I don't have the numbers on hand, but one thing that has shocked me is that you know, right after you taught that 2012 class, we had Sam Miller. He's won a Shirley Jackson Award <laughs> now, right? A uh, bunch 20, of other nominations. In the house, it um, like. <laughs> yeah, we have a we have a bunch of folks who have been nominated for Shirley Jacksons, Nebulas, Hugos, even since I've come on board in 2010. And to me, that was one of the shocking things. I thought if that happened, it would be a long time in the future. But no, you know, several uh, cohorts of people I've worked with. What's that? Right away. <laughs> right away. Yep. <laughs> so they're they're pretty great, but um, I really think the caliber of the teaching is really important too. And so having Nalo and yourself, you know, come back is just such a huge gift and so meaningful. That's one of the reasons we keep getting those amazing groups of students who want to come work with you all. Maybe we get anybody want to ask some questions? And I, I don't, did we want to run the mics around? I, I, it's on? Okay. Um, in reading the story, I learned quite a bit about language that I didn't know before. And uh, I wondered if that is sort of a side thing that, that, that got you interested, the different forms, the way the, the, way that the gift is that the, the, the symbolism, there's no past or future. It's all, uh, I just wondered where, where that idea sort of came from. Um, well, okay, um, the idea about um, sort of gaining knowledge of the future, um, that uh, idea, that was the original you know, sort of inspiration for the story, but um, when I first came up with the idea that I wanted to tell a story about someone who knew that uh, great joy and great pain lay ahead of them, and it uh, decided to go ahead. Um, I really only had, you know, sort of a, a, a really uh, uh, kind of a vague notion of what the of, uh, of what the story was going to be. I in, in that I, uh, initially I didn't know how my protagonist would gain this knowledge of uh, of the future, and. I toyed with a couple ideas. I was thinking maybe I could have my protagonist uh, uh, undergo some sort of uh, meditation training that would give them this insight. Uh, I thought maybe they could uh, take uh, some mind-altering drug that would give them uh, this knowledge. But um, neither of those, you know, seemed particularly interesting to me. And but then, you know, I was thinking of um, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, which is the idea that language. Uh, can shape uh, not only your thoughts but your perception of uh, reality. And even though sort of the strong version of the Sapir Whorf hypothesis has been uh, discredited uh, by linguists, you know, I have always thought it's a really fascinating idea and it has been the basis for a lot of interesting science fiction stories. And I thought, um, having a story in which my protagonist learns an alien language and in that way gains knowledge of, of what uh, lays ahead. That seemed to me a really interesting way to uh, tell this story uh, as a uh, sort of uh, dawning grasp of the, uh, the, the understanding of time as the protagonist learns uh, this language. Well, and I think the movie, the movie does that. The movie does that as well. It pivots around that one moment where she asks, "Who is this child?" Mm. That's the aha pivot around which the, the, the movie. Um, 
the, um, it pivots, this, the aha moment, um, uh, the reveal, is when she is puzzled and is, asks, who is this child? And it's ob at that point, you realize that these visions that have, have been upsetting her have been confusing her because she doesn't know who the child is. And it's only later that she realizes. We know in advance because we're seeing her narrate from the future. But um, that's, that, in my opinion, is the pivotal aha movement. My question is, um, did you read um, um, Slaughterhouse-Five and Vonnegut <laughs> and the Trafamadorians and the image of the caterpillar that we see at that point where the aliens are, the Trafamadorians are slices of a caterpillar and the slices are moments of time, but the caterpillar is aware of all of, all of the moments of time. Um, I have to say that at, at the time that I wrote the story, I had not read Slaughterhouse Five. Oh. Um, and you know, I as for the the use of the uh, caterpillar image in the movie, I I I can't speak to that. I um, uh, it's certainly possible that um, that is a uh, uh, a subtle reference to that, but. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if that was their intention. But I mean, I think, you know, it is, uh, um, uh, I think it's a, uh, a sign of, a, of, a, of an interesting movie that, you know, it uh, is something that lends itself to sort of uh, close examination and multiple interpretations. I think that um, I think that this, you know, um, this movie stands, uh, like, I think uh, watching it uh, multiple times is rewarding um, because uh, I think, yeah, you'll notice more and more um, uh, each, time you see, each time you watch it. Uh, over here, over here, maybe Steve or... Uh, yeah, I loved the story, and the, the movie was great. Um, I, I uh, loved in the story the the way that you tied in the physics, the, the Fermat's principle of least time with mm. with the language, independence of time. I thought it was really brilliant. W was there ever an opportunity, was the screenplay ever have any of that physics in it? Or I know it didn't make the movie, but was that an... Uh, um, well, the... Uh, the the development process for a movie is is very long and you know it goes through a lot of different sort of uh, versions. I I believe that um, Eric, the screenwriter, has said that um, he wrote a hundred drafts over <laughs> these uh, over the uh, the years, um, and you know and you know so, um, I I was not you know. Like I said, I was not actively involved in this. So, you know, he and I would occasionally exchange email, and uh, so he'd you know, give me updates about, you know, uh, sort of just what was happening. Um, but so I, I can't say that there was a point in which uh, Fermat's principle was um, uh, going to be mentioned in the screenplay. Um, I mean, he, yeah, he wrote a draft in which that, that did appear. Um, you know, I don't know exactly, you know, um, you know, I don't know if they uh, tried filming that or not. Um, uh, you know, I know that they, they did film, you know, I think one of the things that happens in the, you know, movie making process is that they, they, they do film things uh, uh, and then you know, sort of just to see how they work on, on screen. And... Um, yeah, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. Uh, I don't know if they actually uh, if they actually filmed that uh, or not. Did you uh, did you go to any of the? Were you a part of any of the filmmaking process? Did you go to the sets at any time? Or I um, I got to uh, visit the set uh, for a couple of days uh, uh, last year. Yes, um, they were filming uh, in the outskirts of uh, Montreal. 
um, uh, at least, you know, I, they, they film, I guess, in a few locations, but uh, I got to visit them when they were uh, outside Montreal. Um, they were actually filming on sort of the, uh, the grounds of a, uh, I guess, an abandoned uh, factory because um, they, were, they had these sets constructed. Um, so I got to see um, if they're actually the sets of the, the tunnel, the passage into the alien craft. Um, they had two sets. Uh, one was vertical. And uh, that was that was an exterior set, um, and then inside, inside a, a like a, a one of the factory buildings, they had a, a horizontal uh, set, uh, the, a horizontal version of the tunnel. Um, so uh, yeah, so what I what I got to see were um, a couple, just a a, a tiny fraction of. The, the scene when they are first entering. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I noted with interest your involvement with Paramount Studios. Uh, that bring back, brought back to my mind um, when I was in grad school at UCLA, Gene Roddenberry visited the student union Ackerman Hall at UCLA and he recounted his experience with executives at Paramount. And basically, Planet of the Apes was doing very well at the time. And when he was trying to describe to executives at Paramount his idea for a new science fiction series, their response was, do apes. Apes sell. Do apes. And I'm wondering if you'd contrast your experience with Paramount with uh, Mr. Roddenberry's. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, like I said earlier, you know, this um, the film was originally financed by uh, Film Nation. So, uh, in a uh, this 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 film was actually sort of made outside the studio system. It was not a Paramount film um, because uh, well, when uh, when Eric Heiser was going around with the screenplay um, initially. Um, and you know, at that point, when uh, you know there wasn't uh, a director attached and there wasn't uh, you know, any stars attached, um, all the studios turned turned him down. Uh, it it was only with, um, that after Film Nation, an independent company, decided to finance it. Um, Denis was attached, Amy Adams was attached. Then uh, uh, only in the wake of that did Paramount become a distributor. But um, uh, they, um, you know, d the director Denis Villeneuve, he he had final cut on this, so uh, uh, he was able to make this without um, a great deal of uh, you know uh, studio interference. Well, let me rephrase that then. How would you compare your experience with Hollywood? With Mr. Roddenberry's description. Well, um, well, obviously, Mr. Roddenberry, he he wound up making something that was not apes. He stuck to his guns. <laughs> uh, In other words, I guess the way I view that is he stuck to his guns and stood up to city hall. Is the way I view that. Any comments on that? Um, well. Uh, uh, like I said, yeah, uh, yeah. Eric Eric Heiser, you know, he he was he was asked to uh, to change it in I think uh, various ways a number of times. Yeah, make the protagonist a man, make it a more conventional alien invasion movie, all those things. But he stuck. He yes, it, uh, Eric Heiser absolutely stuck to his guns, um, and uh, I yeah I was very fortunate that. Um, that he was the one who wanted to adapt this. Um, uh, he 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 was passionate about this project. Um, he was not someone who was uh, uh, so he was not a hired gun, and you know who was just uh, t 
taking the the job for uh, a paycheck and would do whatever you know someone told him to do. He uh, he sincerely believed in it, and um, uh, so I think that is uh, you know he he deserves uh, uh, all the credit or you know, or like a huge amount of credit for this movie turning out the way it did. Question. Hi, uh, in, in converting this to sort of a Hollywood uh, kind of conflict, one of the things I found interesting is how it sort of played with uh, a very classic trope of everybody uniting under a common significant threat, um, that nations can get together if the threat is large enough from somewhere else, something alien. And I was wondering, I, I, I feel like the film does interesting things with that trope, but I was wondering what you think about that and how it contributes to a sort of history of films that I think is like Pacific Rim, uh, Independence Day, uh, where nations all come together. Um, well, actually, I would, uh, I think I would contrast this film with uh, those, um, not just in sort of the more uh, overt aspects, but I'd say that um, what happens is not in, in, in Arrival is not exactly that uh, the different nations unite in order to combat an alien threat. Um, because, you know, they don't actually unite to combat an alien threat. Um, that, uh, what happens is that um, a gift of communication uh, is what allows the nations to unite. And it's that gift of communication that is actually offered by the aliens. So, um, uh, so uh, it is not the case in this film that, um, that, uh, that nations you know, uh, put aside their differences in order to fight a, a a greater uh, enemy. Um, it is that what you know what they perceive to be an enemy uh, actually um, uh, offers them a perspective which allows them to you know, uh, uh, realize that that they um, that they that they have shared interests among themselves. Right, so do you see that as an intentional inversion of the trope or that it's playing in that trope in some way? I think that is an intentional inversion of the trope because um, that, uh, uh, that is uh, an expansion of the um, sort of the more, uh, the smaller scale storyline of the film um, it's about uh, language and understanding, and um, that uh, the the global conflict in the movie it is the it's, it's about language promoting you know creating understanding uh, sort of writ large. Um, so in uh, so there's there's the sort of more personal small scale storyline. Um, and there's the you know in the background the larger scale storyline, but ultimately they're both um, they're both built around the same theme. And I think yeah, so it is that it uh, uh, yeah, so I would say that it is a, sort of a deliberate inversion of that uh, of the sort of conventional trope of uh, yeah nations uniting to uh, uh, fight a common enemy. So maybe. Um Oh, one one question really wants to be asked back there. Um, I have, I have, um, but uh, you know, I I'm I'm very well aware that uh, the odds of uh, anything else getting made are the odds of any any anything going from an option to uh, uh, a released film, you know, are probably between 1,001 and 10,000 to one. So, um, uh, you know, it would be great to uh, have something else of mine made into a film, but 
I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to assume that, you know, uh, uh, that that's going to happen, you know, just because this one happened. So without, so, you know, instead of a film, though, what I like, I like you as a writer. So, um, so what are you, what are you writing these days? What can we look forward to seeing uh, coming out from you? Um, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to write uh, short stories. I have a second collection of short stories under contract um, that um, will probably come out. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's still a little ways off from completion, but um, that'll be coming out from Knopf in a couple of years, probably. We can hardly wait. So I want to uh, thank Ted for uh, making this happen, and, and Shelley, and, the, and uh, come back for more. And uh, we, you know, and we we really appreciate everybody's support of the of, of Clarion and the Clark Center. So um, let's let's keep them moving forward. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you.